You have been claimed by Poseidon, Earthshaker, Stormbringer, Percy Jackson, son of Poseidon. All the way from Providence, Rhode Island, welcome to the Percy Jackson Prophecy. It's a podcast dedicated to the Percy Jackson book series and show on Disney+. Plus. So let's hold fast and brave the storm. Hello, everyone, and welcome back. My name is Mary Larson. My name is Reese. And we are so excited to be delving into the second episode of Disney Plus's new series. What I loved about this is they actually released episodes one and two on the very same day. Buddy, why do you think they did that? Why do you think they dropped two episodes at once? I have no idea why they did that. Daddy. Daddy is joining us here. <laughs> He's going to be sharing his dad's details in a little bit. And because you're sitting here with us in the studio, sure. of course, knowing that this show is spoiler free, why do you think Disney Plus decided to drop two, two episodes at once? Because they left off the first episode on a very intentional cliffhanger. Uh, there and there was, if they're trying to keep the episodes to that half hour to 35 minute range, there's no way they were able to tell that first story, that first episode, without really getting into that next episode. It wouldn't have felt complete. It would have felt like, okay, this is really cheap, like cheap and cheesy if they were going to keep doing the whole cliffhanger thing. Mm -hmm. So I think they wanted to tell a good, complete story that helps propel us into the remainder of the season. And rather than, like you said, I mean, here we are in the second episode. We find out who his dad is. It's Poseidon. I agree with you. If they just had episode one by itself and then a week in between, people would have just been like, all right, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we like, already know. Really? We on. know who dad is. We've already figured this out. Yeah. So for people who wanted to watch the two episodes together, they could do that rather than having an epically long one episode. Totally so, agree. I like this. And buddy, when you watched these episodes with your class, did you watch watch both episode one and two in the same day or did you watch them on different days so we just we watched both on different days so the first one we obviously did seven days before christmas break and the next one was five was about two days after okay so you watched them in subsequent days mm -hmm. that's cool we of course watched them Broken up as well, but I bet most of the listeners of this podcast and most of the viewers of the show uh, got to watch them back to back. Well, on that note, let's get into the show. Reese, will you start things off for us and tell us the episode title for episode two? So I think we're going to be delving into it. Nope. What's the title? I become Supreme Lord of the Bathroom. <laughs> I become <laughs> Supreme Lord of the Bathroom. What an epic title, of course. Something that I wouldn't necessarily want for myself. I don't want to be called the Lord of the Bathroom. What? It's potty humor. I, you know, I would say... You know, we talked about it in the first episode with the Minotaur's underwear and Gabe's toilet problems. The the potty humor in the Percy Jackson series continues, and I'm here for it. I am here for it, especially knowing that our lead is 12 years old. Reese, you, my, my amazing co-host, you're 10 years old, going to be turning 11 soon. Do you find potty humor, like the the Supreme Lord of the Bathroom, do you find that funny? Uh, Yeah. But, um, can I say something? Are we gonna meet talking toilets next? I don't. I don't know if we're meeting talking toilets. I'm not gonna lie, uh, my love. I find potty humor entertaining. Right? So and, and I'm forty, <laughs> so it's it's worth it. Okay, let's so get past the potty what I, humor. What I like about this episode, for those of you who are listening in the future, this is the episode where Percy wakes up and he's in the camp's infirmary. Uh, he gets to meet Mister D, who's the camp director, and sees Mister Brunner is part horse, which means he is a 
Centaur. And his actual name is Chiron. So this will be interesting. Are we calling him Chiron in the show? Are we calling him Mr. Brenner in the show? We're going to find out. And of course, Percy uh, doesn't get claimed until the end of this episode. So while he's waiting, he's hanging out with the kids in the Hermes cabin. He gets to meet some other campers like Luke, Clarice. Uh, He gets to learn Annabeth, uh, meets all these different friends. They do capture the flag. Percy gets claimed by his dad, Poseidon, and he gets told about this epic quest that he is going to have to go on because Poseidon is asking upon his son to help retrieve the Master Bolt because Zeus thinks that he's done it. And of course, Grover says, I don't think your mom's dead. I think she's just hanging out with Hades. Hades in the underworld. So before we delve into this episode, it is time, of course, for dad's details. We've got Reese's dad, Blake, who I usually podcast with. For friends who don't know, Blake and I have a series of other podcasts. We podcast about the Harry Potter series. We cover Outlander. We cover Bridgerton, loads of other shows. And dad is here to give his details on some of the episode stuff. So the writer and the director are the same from the last episode. Uh, The director was James Bobin, who was the A director for this show. And the writers were, once again, Jonathan E. Steinberg, who is the co-showrunner of uh, of. Percy Jackson and Rick Riordan as well. So it's an interesting. Uh, it's interesting that uh, the the creative team is still the same, although that usually happens because w- these episodes are shot in what's called blocks, and generally you'll have a director and a writer and an editor and maybe even a director of photography or a person who's in charge of all the lighting. They'll work on certain blocks of episodes, like episode one, two, and three, or episode one and two. Uh, And then concurrently, you'll have other people working on other episodes, like a a new writing staff or a new director working on episodes three and four and so on. So that's what's called blocking, and they're writing in in blocks. But what I do want to say, Mary and Reese, is the thing that I have noticed about this show so far, the lighting is spectacular do you know what he's talking about reese when he's talking about the lighting give us an example of what you think dad's talking about so with the minotaur scene it's not like there's so in this episode for example episode two yeah um i think in the the capture the flag it wasn't too bright it wasn't too dark it was just the amount of sunlight like it was covered by trees sunlight Mm -hmm. and it's they make it look like it's not just light coming from above, like millions of them. It looks like a single sun that's getting blocked out from the trees. Right. I think that's the way you're talking about that. I'm absolutely talking about that. And how, how about all the firelight? We had campfires yeah, and candles. Yeah, excellent stuff. And, and uh, they're allowing the firelight. I mean, it's a, it's kind of an illusion, but they're allowing the firelight to illuminate our characters, which is really important, right? And it's also... It also shows what's coming, right? Because they're going down, or well, at least they're going to be, con- you know, having a conflict ostensibly with Hades, right? So it's showing that that's where they're headed. And another thing that I really noticed too is the coloring. Uh, if you go back to the conversation that Percy was having with Luke about parents and getting claimed, they're actually in front of what appears to be Poseidon's temple. Right, it, that blue color. Uh, let's be real; it's a tealish blue. Oh, sorry, tealish my blue. favorite of the colors. <laughs> and it is awesome how they are again, just showing you straight up right away that Percy is Poseidon's kid without you even knowing it. Right, it, it, they're having it in front of these conversations. So that that tealish blue with the orange, um, with the orange shirts, it, it's playing with what's called the color wheel. Mm. Right, the color wheel mm-hmm. is uh, it's it's the wheel upon all which color exists, and every color has an equal and opposite of itself. And wouldn't you know, orange is the opposite of blue. blue. So how cool is that? That this whole sh- all the shirts are orange, uh-huh. and he doesn't fit in necessarily um, because you he's mean, you mean like his shirt doesn't fit? <laughs> well, even even when he wakes up in the infirmary, he's wearing blue. Uh, he's wearing a blue shirt. That's right. What? Does blue does blue go with white? Yeah, it go it goes with it, but the opposite of it is orange. So these are things that when you're watching the show, you really need to pay attention to because these are opportunities that the storytellers 
are giving you to see the story outside of what is being said or with the way that uh, it, it's being shot. It, it's what's called, um, it's, it's alluding to what's coming ahead. I love it. Well, thank you, Blake, mm -hmm. for your dad's details. Do you have anything you want to say, Reese, about what he's brought up? No. Awesome. No. It is time for our Trident rating. So we, of course, rate each episode of this show on a scale of one to five, one being the absolute worst. We're talking Gabe's toilet time to five being the best, finding out who your godparent is. Oh, my goodness gracious. So uh, last episode, I gave a 4.5. I am bumping this up to 4.6. I will tell you, I really liked this episode. I am feeling it in many ways, but I like to leave a little wiggle room because because I feel like it's just going to get better and better. But Reese, after we watched this episode together, I asked you right away, buddy, what's your trident reading? And what did you say? Five all the way. Five all the way. All the way. You are here for it. This has so far been, uh, you liked this one even more than the first. And of course, now it's time for our GBGs. Our GBG, what does it stand for, Reese? Good, bad, and great. Good, bad, and great. My good for this episode is the humor of Mr. D. Mr. D's humor got me laughing. And it, it also got dad laughing. Do you remember how much dad was laughing? I know. Where he was just like, Peter Johnson's here. <laughs> you know, so I just, I absolutely loved Mr. D in all the different parts that he was in this episode. He made me laugh. My bad was the amount of times that Percy was pushed down during the capture of the flag scene. I feel like had that been my body, I would have had broken bones. I would not be getting up. I was I was going, ooh, ooh, ow, ow. Granted, Percy is 12 in this episode. So fine. He's got some resiliency. Also, he's half God. He's a demigod. Fine. Even more resiliency. But as a 41-year-old woman, I, would, I saw him falling down, falling onto pebbles, being pushed down into bushes. I was feeling the pain, thinking how much Advil I would need after this. Granted, there's good news of the end but please send me back to the infirmary oh. i need some help and then my great for this episode was camp itself camp half blood needs to be a place that i can go i actually just learned today that there are camp half bloods around the country that people have created things so we're going to look into this more i don't know if there's one necessarily near us in rhode island but camp half blood i loved listening to the loons you pointed out that we could it, hear the it looks like new hampshire a bit it looks like new hampshire it looks like maine it looks for those of you who are not in the new england area of the united states this is what camping looks like for us here right we've got the lakes we've got the loons which we hear when we're when we ourselves reach camp in Maine, um, the canoes, the the beautiful trees. So you and I were feeling very much so at home. Getting the New Hampshire vibe. Getting the New Hampshire kind of vibe. But I especially loved all of the stained glass in the room that Mr. D hangs out in. Also. If I could be sitting in that room, overlooking the lake, listening to the loons and reading a book and having a hot cup of cocoa. Ultimate heaven. Ultimate heaven. <laughs> Excuse me? Yeah. Just you, those listeners who don't know Greek mythology, Mr. D. Oh, yeah. He's di he is Dionysus. Yeah, so we're going to go into that because I think that's really important. After we do our GBGs, I would love to hear a little bit more. So, Reese, what were your GBGs? What was your good, your bad, and your great? So, my good about this episode is Clarice gets blasted with funky toilet water. <laughs> Funky toilet water. Oh. Um, I don't. Percy doesn't know this yet, but he. Oh, we can't, we can't do any spoils. I know. Percy doesn't know what how it happened. Yeah. It's just. It just so he's getting shoved into. He's getting his face nearly shoved into a What's toilet. What's that called again? When your face is in a toilet, isn't it like called a swishy or a flushy? It's called a flushy. <laughs> Gross. So that includes more potty humor part. That's right. So, I'm just thinking, Percy. What are you doing? You can't get shoved your head into the toilet water. So, but then, so that was your great. Is I, that Clarice gets blasted not, with toilet water? Great, oh, sorry, you're good. good. But, what was your bad? So my bad. Percy has to go to a quest in the underworld. For God's sake, why? <laughs> He's like, I do not want to do this. Would you want to go on a quest to the underworld? Yes. You would? You would You would rather leave a beautiful camp like that, listening to loons, playing Capture the Flag? I want to prove myself. Okay, you would like some glory as well. And how about your great? What was your great? It's called Cleos. Cleos, thank you. What's your great for this episode? My great. He gets claimed by Poseidon. Finally, Percy gets a sign that his father is noticing him. 
as Lizzo would say, it's about damn time. Now, like, what? what it's why, about damn time. <laughs> why? Why did it take Poseidon so long? He's ignored his son. What? Is he slow like a snail? I, I, you know, snails, some snails are in the water. So I would believe that. All right. So we've got our GBGs and friends, for those of you who are new to our podcast here at Miriam Blake Media, we of course love to hear your feedback and your calling in. So we do have some listener feedback that we're going to check on out in a wee little bit. But before we do all of our listener feedback, we're going to delve into this episode. And Reese, you just brought up such an important thing. There are 12 cabins for 12 gods at the camp. This and is something that we here. learn. And um, I need to go over who these people are. So let's at least go over the ones that we've met. So we meet Poseidon, son. Uh, and we, So we know Poseidon, Zeus, and Hades. We don't meet Poseidon so, yet. Well, no, we meet his son. So uh-huh. Zeus, they said, is pretty much in charge, and he has a master lightning bolt. And he's rude. And Poseidon is the uh, sea god. Good nature. Hades is the god of the... Underworld, and he's and very the crude. Underworld means what for people who don't know? But um, the underworld means for people who have people who have vomited, died. Okay, so people beheaded, who have died, killed. So Hades is in charge of the dead. Poseidon is in charge of the sea. Good news. Zeus is in charge of pretty much everything in the sky. Then, um, and he, P.S. Zeus mm-hmm. is kind of rude. Okay, well we're gonna we're gonna make our own opinions on that. Thank you very much, Mister D. Dionysus is the ki- god of what? And he's what the god he? of wine. But for now, he's the god of cola. <laughs> That's what he's drinking is cola. Yeah. What else? Is Dionysus just a king of wine or is he a king of other things? And friends, I'm asking um, these he's questions. The king, he's of, the king of other stuff. Because I'm asking Reese these questions just off the cuff. I'm, I'm testing your knowledge, Reese. Um, we didn't prep this. Do you need Do you need me to look it up or do you know some other things I know. that Dionysus is He's the is god of wine, party, theater, and big cats. And big cats. Yeah. He was wearing a shirt with tigers yeah. on it. Yeah. We're not big cats. Okay. We're good. not kitten. Okay. <laughs> okay. So Come here. Okay. What the heck? Okay. Do, are these quotes from the book? Or no, you're just, okay. Nah. So he's the god of, of especially wine. And, and big cats. And Zeus, and Zeus tells him you can't have any more wine. So that's why we see him with a no cola bottle at first. All right. Then we also meet... Mr. Brunner, who's now named, we're maybe going to be Kyrie, calling him Chiron, but he's, but he's not a god. We meet Luke, who is the son of, of Hermes. Hermes. And Mr. Chiron, Mr. Brunner Chiron, tells us that Hermes is the god of travelers. What about? So he so he lets a lot of people in, including the people who haven't been claimed yet. Then we meet Clarice. The daughter of Ares, the god of war. Ares is the god of war. And, and then we meet Anna. Oh, and violence? Blood. Oh, gosh. That's like, like my least favorite thing in the world. And combat. Mm. I'll tell things. you what. I would not be a daughter of Ares. Me, me. <laughs> and then I would be Hermes. And then we meet Annabeth, who is the daughter of... Athena. And Athena is the god of... She's the goddess of oh, wisdom, sorry, battle strategy, and cooking, Ooh. writing. Ooh. And she's also a god of architecture. That's really got me. Athena's like a full blown god. Did she care about building? I yes. like I like that. And is there something else? We have our little lass here. Is there something else that, that Athena is the goddess of while you're here? Quick. Athena is also the goddess of arts and crafts. Oh yes. Thank you. High five for that. Can't forget that. So those are the gods and goddesses that we are introduced to or they get referenced in this episode but as i said there are 12 cabins 12 olympian gods uh, who potentially have children so i think we're gonna meet more of them and reese and my my little lass felicity here know a lot about greek mythology so i'm gonna be counting on you all very much um so dionysus as you said he was a god of wine but now he's hanging out (laughs) now he's hanging out as the camp counselor what did you think of him when, when Percy Jackson walks in and he says, excuse me, I'm Percy Jackson. And he says, Peter Johnson's here. Very dumb. Do you think he was being dumb? Yes. Or do you think he was being rude? Both. Ooh. Can but you be dumb, and- dumb. Okay. Yeah, I, I was not impressed by that. And yet- He's supposed to be cheery. He's cheery in the myth, as cheery as a cherry. But... <laughs> 
but not he's, in this he's, show. He's very, he's sour as a sourpuss. Because he probably doesn't get to have his wine as he was trying to have Percy get, get for sour, him. Get it? Sour, sourpuss. Yes. And Mr. Brenner comes in and he's half horse. Me! And half horses, of course, are centaurs. Centaurs! Um, and he tells, he talks with Percy a little bit because Percy is worried that he lost his pen. He, lo- he feels that he lost his pen a little while ago. And what does Mr. Brenner say about his pen? Check your pocket. And Percy says, no, I lost it. And Mr. Brenner's like, check your pocket. Yes. And he, then he says, as long as you surrender it, it'll always find its way back to you. And mm-hmm. then... And that's what he found out, right? Percy has it later on. Uh, he finds it in his pocket then. He finds it again when he's doing the capture the flag. So this is a magical pen that he can't lose. And I got to tell you, when I was 12 years old, if you had left me in charge with a very important pen, I probably would have lost it. How do you do with pens and pencils, buddy? I lose a lot. Yeah. So the but fact if- that this is a magical pen that keeps coming back. Good. Even if it wasn't a sword, I would want this pen. I feel like that is super great. Um, Percy says he feels alone. Uh, you know, he's he's he just looks alone. He, he feels kind of unloved. And then he gets to go into Hermes' cabin and his bed is on the floor. Oh, my God. But inside his bag, he's next he to finds, a rat He finds blue candy. Blue and what, jelly beans. What is important about these? This blue candy? It, it's the it's something that his mom always used to give him when he was small. He was sad. She'd give him a some blue jelly beans. Say everything's gonna be fine. And that's of course something that you know from the book. And we are keeping this episode these episodes spoiler free. But just know that. The blue candy is really expanded upon. It's very meaningful that his mom gets him this blue candy. And this is the last thing he has is of his mom, right? Uh, in him with him right now. This is the yeah. last thing that he has yeah. with him in this bag. And he's in this cabin, and then this big kid comes up, Luke, and Luke he says, Castile. "I'm sorry. Uh, what happened? I know what you're going through." And he ends up. Um, really kind of befriending and taking Percy under his wing. He says, you know, we're going to find yeah, out what you're a, good he's at. He's actually a really, really good guy. Yeah, he I tells- like Luke. He, he has a re- just a, a friendly, good-natured vibe from him. When, when I first see him, I'm like, this guy's got a good vibe. He does. He takes Percy and he takes him to do archery, which Percy sadly <laughs> is the worst <laughs> at. <laughs> and you pointed out something that I love that this show did. So when this with this show... Um, the the students, the children at the camp, they're all various ages, but they all seem to be, you know, relatively of school age. Uh, they are all different shapes, all different sizes, all different colors, all different nationalities. And we even see the first student that we see taking archery, who is doing a flaming arrow, might we say. Is in a wheelchair. Is in a wheelchair. And I think that is so cool. I think that is so great that they're able to showcase um, people with different abilities. Um, You know my sister, so your Aunt Jeannie is frequently in a wheelchair, and so it's very important for people to see themselves on screen, to feel that connection. So I love that they showed not only, because that person in the wheelchair, she could have been anywhere, but no, she was rocking and rolling the the archery, which I think was so neat. I know, and I think that girl is Apollo. How come? Apollo's child? Yeah, God of Apollo. Um, God... Apollo, the god, he's the god of light, poetry, art, music, archery, and ah. etc., etc., et So you think because she was so good that she's probably oh, a daughter and of- and his music. Oh, I think I might be a daughter of Apollo then. All right, so we've got the archery. We've got- um, Poetry. What does he do where he's hitting that metal, that hot, hot metal? Hephaestus. What? God bless you? What did you- Did you just sneeze? What did you just say? Hephaestus. <laughs> what does Hephaestus mean? Hephaestus Blank. Blank. is a person. He he's a god. Okay. He's the god of mining and metalworking. He's the god of craft. He's the god of And he's one of the gods that we blacksmith. see at the end credits when they're doing all of that art yeah. deco almost. <laughs> okay, so that child, that student there hitting the metal, doing that the craft work, he most likely is a child of Hephaestus's, right? And his hands are just like bursting in the gloves. And Obviously, Percy does not do well with that either. The um, second hit, it just flies <laughs> off and burns clothing. Good luck, buddy. So Percy's on his own mission, and Grover goes into the woods, and out pops this woman who's like a tree woman. Dryad. What? Dryad. What is a dryad? A maiden of the woods. A maiden of the woods. Mm-hmm. Now, she acted very caring of 
uh, Grover. Where do satyrs come from? Uh, nature spirits, gods so, alike. So satyr. So Grover is a satyr, which is a half human, half uh, goat. Goat. Am I supposed to feel that satyrs' moms are dryads? Is that a possibility? Because this one it seems is, like a actually, mom. It actually is. In the oh. myths, they have mothers as dryads and naiads. Okay. So maybe we can feel like that was Grover's mom, the tree woman, or at least someone who was like a mother figure for him because she's telling him, oh, you're so hard on yourself. You're picking at your little horns again. <laughs> Let's stop doing that. And then she points him inside this cave. It is the cloven council and it's all other people who are maybe satyrs and they end up telling Grover some really important information they end up and, telling him what and all, just what do they end up telling him that's Sally Jackson oh this is a spoiler no, free it's, this this was all in this episode well that, it also, that when the minotaur squished her she didn't squish like a banana uh, an old banana with a bad people uh, she evaporated Hades reached out and stole her before she died so that is super important. Grover knows a squished mortal usually is a bit messier than evaporating into dust. It, it's all just guts, blood, and brains, heart everywhere. Which luckily Grover said in a much nicer way as squished banana because gl- blood and guts and everything makes me nauseous. Yeah. So I appreciated that Grover said, I think they'd be a lot more squishy inside. <laughs> uh, by the way, as I'm watching this, I think I'm Grover. I think if I had to be a character in this show, yeah, I would be a be satyr. Grover. Yeah, I've, so far I'm pretty sure I align best with Grover. I think that's how I would describe squishing He's somebody. Nervous and, everything. and and he goes up and he tells Mr. Brunner Chiron and Mr. D, "Hey, nice. guess what? I don't think uh, Percy's mom's dead. This is big news. Percy's depressed. He he misses yeah. his mom. <laughs> Can I please tell him?" And they, Mr. D and Mr. Brunner, say, "No." They say no, and they say that the truth can be very dangerous. And they say, we want you to steer clear from him. They're actually telling him, you cannot go near your best friend. No, Dionysus said that. And you cannot tell him the truth um, because the truth can be dangerous. And I hate this for Grover. Grover has tried to do the right thing. He already had to lie to Percy about Mrs. Dodds and all that other kind of stuff and being half goat. Okay, he's done lying to Percy. Please tell the truth at this point. Percy then, uh, after his day with Luke... He's having this dream, and he's sitting by a fire, and there's a voice. And a ghost. And the voice, and the voice says, I know how you feel. Wait, no. I'll, you can want I justice. do a quote? Can I do quote it? You want a quote? Yeah, I'll do it. Okay, as long as it doesn't give any spoilers, because <clears throat> I know you read all this stuff. Ooh, yeah. Okay, are you going to get into your voice? Uh, he left you here. Left you with nothing. I know how you feel. You want what's been taken from you. You want justice. Now, Reese, along with all the book readers, most likely knows who this person is. Okay, you're not going to tell me because it's a spoiler, but do you know who it is? Okay. Yep. Okay. I'm going to guess as my mere mortal theory of the week because... But, but, but. Okay, you want me to save it for the it's end? At the end, yeah. Okay, I'll save it for the end, but that will be what my mere mortal theory will be. Um, Percy wakes up. And Luke comforts him and says, hey, buddy, don't worry about it. We all have intense nightmares. We all also have dyslexia, which is when you couldn't when he couldn't see the words on the paper. We all have ADHD. We all have difficulties paying attention. But here's the cool thing, Percy. You're like everybody else for the first time. We all have this. You don't need to be embarrassed. And this made me feel so good because when you're at this age, Luke you know, is comforting him mm-hmm. when he feels so bad. Luke says, I know, I know what how you're feeling. I've been through this before. I've felt this. I know, I I feel your pain. I know how to help it too. You and I were talking earlier today about how important it is to have that with classmates and to have it with friends at camp or friends that you have in the neighborhood. Um, how important it is to have those connections, to have things that you have in common every once in a while. You don't have to have the same things in common with every friend of yours, every single thing, because that'd be boring. But to have some things in common is super important. And I love that Percy gets this because he's in the previous episode, he said he always was alone. He was always sitting alone at the lunch and he was always being told by people, you're weird, you're wrong, you're special. And here's Luke, this cooler, older. 19. Yeah, guy saying, it's okay, man. You're just like all of the rest of us. You don't have to be embarrassed anymore. And they go on this quest for glory, which you said we now need to call the word 
Cleos. Cleos. It's such an important word that even as the, the kids are walking off for capture the flag, they're chanting Cleos. Clarice pushes him and she does all this mean stuff. Stay down. Um, we learn about the burnt offerings. Ew. Tell me more about this. So the burnt offerings in the Percy Jackson series is when a s- specific camper, um, well, like a, you know, the cabin, comes up to the fireplace and burns the most delicious part of, they think, of their dinner. So you take a look at your dinner. You take a look at your dinner plate. Like, let's say it was a Thanksgiving meal. What's your favorite part of the Thanksgiving meal? The cranberry ripest sauce? cranberry sauce. Okay. And the so bun. <laughs> and you're looking at them and they're like, I'm going to miss this. You walk. <laughs> so this here's what looks like. Okay. So you burn what you what you most missed and then that's get their attention and they'll listen to you. Can you go back for seconds to go get what you miss? Like if this was you, Reese, and you had to give your cranberry sauce to the gods <laughs> as a burnt offering. <laughs> no. Are you allowed to go get seconds at least? Everyone, just picture that. Over the holidays, your favorite food that you just ate. And I'll bite it. I'll well, bite it before. I but you it. have to give it to the gods as an offering because the gods can tell that that was important to you. And that's what helps them listen to you. And what's interesting is that we get a scene with Percy. And what is he burning? Blue jelly beans. Blue jelly beans. And when he's doing that, he's not speaking to his Poseidon. He's, he's not speaking to his dad. He's, he's actually his mom. He's talking to his mom. Oh my gosh. As a mom myself, I'm sitting here tearing up because here he is burning his sweet little jelly beans. The ripest one, actually. Oh, the ripest jelly beans. As if a jelly bean could be ripe. And he's trying to talk to her. And he's saying, you know, he can ignore me, and then he, but he can't ignore you. So he and then he gets all sinister. He's, he's making himself... Too much. He's making okay. Back well, he's, to this. He's he's getting he's getting intense. But then, then he goes home. He's walking home from no, no, burning I, his. I mean, he's like getting way too much. He's talking a little too much. Okay, if I was him, if I was right there, I was saying, "Man, you're putting a little too much on that. You you gotta just cool down a bit." I know. Well, his mom just died two days ago. <laughs> I, I know. I was saying he hasn't really been able I, to cry that much yet. I I was I'd be saying. I went through the same way. I know how you're feeling, man. It's just, you've got to tone it down a Are little. Are you telling me that if I died, you wouldn't burn two jelly beans and try to talk to me? Uh... <laughs> what food would you burn? What was your most important food if you wanted to talk to dead mom? All my all the Reese's Pieces in the world. Oh, wow. I feel honored. I would smell that peanut butter and I would come and visit you for sure. And I would definitely listen. High five for the peanut butter lovers. Yes. Okay. So on Percy's way back from the blue candy burning... He bumps into Clarice and the bullies in the toilet situation, which you, of course, said was your was your good. And Clarice is saying, I want you to tell me that you made up the story of the Minotaur. And if you don't, we're going to give you a flushy. Why does Clarice want him to admit that he did not defeat the Minotaur? What's what's the big deal out of this? I have no idea why she's doing it. You don't know why Clarice thinks this is a big deal? Well, I'm going to tell you this. I think it's a big deal in the very beginning. Hey, wait, I think I know why. Okay. Clarice feels like... If this kid kills something else big, I am going to be looked over. I think that's who she's doing it to him. She's doing this to him because she doesn't want him to get all big and powerful. Has she killed a minotaur before? Probably not. Nope. Right? Grover, in the beginning of the episode when Percy's waking up, Grover looks over to the minotaur horn. And he's like, Percy, this is a big deal. No and I wanted seen. people to know that you did this. Grover, you. And No, I think that that's really Curse kind of Grover. You, Grover. No, that's great. Grover went and like made sure that he had the horn because he knows that Percy's a big deal. And he wanted people to know about this. So and it went a little flip-flop. When I'm, yeah, it didn't, it, didn't, it didn't get the effect that Grover was going for. Annabeth, of course, is watching the entire time. We learn a little bit more about her, knowing that she's the daughter of Athena. She's always a couple steps ahead. And also we learn about her relationship with Luke and how Luke uh, kind of protected her and helped come along with her with this girl, Thalia. And um, can I give a little moment to explain who Thalia is? Oh, I would love that. So Thalia is the daughter of... Of Zeus, she's another forbidden kid. I think, but I think her smell was been too big for a monster. Uh, Percy's got to be a little. Percy's got to be big, but a daughter of Zeus, the the full blown king of Olympus. Oh, you reek like six million poops. I don't know why we're talking about her smelling bad. I picture her smelling like a pine tree. Oh yeah, and that my <laughs> oh, this yeah. is a sad, so, well, sad story. Wait, no, well, we'll I talk want, about. I no, want to get into no, it. No, that's next episode. I already oh. know that part because you told me about it. So she's a forbidden kid. She's Zeus's daughter. 
And she, Luke, and Annabeth are on their way to camp with their satyr, and sadly, Thalia got killed. <sighs> And uh, it's it's been something that's bonded Luke and Annabeth ever since. And he says, he compliments Annabeth. He says, she always is six steps ahead of everybody. Whatever team she's on, that's the team that I want to be on. I'm always on her side. And she's like a little sister to me. And they're basically half siblings. Why? Um, their, their dad, Athena and Hermes' dad are both Zeus. But they're both from different mothers. So everybody's like cousins in this show. Uh, not exactly. Poseidon is just... So everyone else here is basically kids of Zeus. Poseidon, just straight out of it. Okay. All right. I like that. He has his own family tree. He has his own family tree. It all... Guess what happened? It just went down one bit. <laughs> it's just it's just Percy right now. So the, they start playing Capture the Frag. And Annabeth takes Percy away. Luke's doing his thing with ever, all the other warriors. And Annabeth puts on this hat that she got from her mom, which makes her completely invisible. Which is super cool. Um, th- I think that also relates with the Harry Potter invisibility cloak thing. What do you mean? Um, Harry has his own invisibility cloak. And he can just put it on any time he has it. And Annabeth, I think she has the same too whenever she has it it's in her bag harry has it all around his bag too and whenever they're doing something they want to do but they know that Annabeth is just doing this for show harry does it for a good reason you're a wizard harry hey uh, yeah. yeah thank you haggard <laughs> and Annabeth's just doing it for show harry does it when he needs to so i think that's just the kind of difference but i'm just referencing but you're that. finding that yeah being that harry potter is another one of our favorite series you're saying that you like that there's something that they have in common um Annabeth leaves Percy and she's like, you'll know what to do. And instead, Percy does the floss. And then? Then he pees. Ew. Let's be real. Toilet humor, potty humor. I'm here for it. You're here for it. High five for potty humor. Then he just starts stroking a lizard. Oh, little salamander. We do not have those things here in New England. Whatever those little salamanders were. Uh, And then Clarice comes up with one of my favorite quotes of the episode. She says, "Yeah, glory glory is fine. Can I do it? Oh, please do it. Yeah. Yeah, glory's fine. Revenge is more fun. Then she just slams her spear down, and it just crackles with electricity. That's what it was. It was electricity inside that thing. Yeah. That thing was just frightening, and I would have done what Percy did, which is after he was pushed over, ran away. But then he gets pushed again, and again, and again, and then he's pushed on pebbles. And, and he gets slashed. And and what Clary says to him, she's like, I don't want to maim you. I don't even want to kill you. I don't want, I want I'm not actually I'm not actually interested in maiming or killing you. Yeah. I just want you to admit that you're a fraud. Now what does that mean? A fraud means a git. Mm, what is no nope, keep going. What else? Do you know what that, do you know what a fraud is? I can help you. No. A liar. She says, I just want you to admit that you're lying. Lying about what? Killing the Minotaur. That is what Clarice is so mad at Percy about. She has never killed a Minotaur. She's never killed She's anything. She's jealous. Even close. She is jealous. So she said, I don't want to maim you. I don't want to kill you. I, don't even want, I want you to admit that you lied about killing the Minotaur. That's what I want from you. She, That's why she's chasing after him so much. And and if Percy just has said one thing, he just crossed his fingers behind his back, he would have just gotten away and Clarice let him go. He'd be able to go back to the flag. Do you think that's in Percy's personality, though, to, to uh, lie like that? Not, I don't think so. No, to a big boy like Clarice, I would have done that. <laughs> I would have crossed my fingers right behind my back. Buddy, I already told you I would have ran away, so that's okay. I wouldn't have... Okay. I would strike Clarice down with my sword. I would be stabbing every nope, single one of we're not one supposed to meme or kill. Okay? <laughs> now, of course, we find out throughout this whole process, Percy gets thrown in the water, his wounds heal. We get the trident above him. Everybody's shocked because not only is he being claimed, which in and of itself is a big deal, but he's being claimed by one of the big three. And we get the voiceover. So we get Chiron's voice, Poseidon, Earthshaker, Stormbringer. So we get all this voiceover and we get these cool scenes of Percy now moving into the gorgeous teal house. And it has these kind of prehistoric skeletons. Yeah. And his bed's made of water. What the heck? It looked like a plesiosaurus hanging uh, from the ceiling. Not a plesiosaurus. What would you think it was? Uh, like a that aquatic dinosaur creature. Like a, it looked like a dinosaur. Yeah, it looks like a baby mosasaur. Oh, okay, I can I can be down with that. So he's there, and it's a big deal that he's a forbidden child. Uh, he says that you are your father's only hope to find the master bolt. What the heck is a master bolt, Chiron? I need a little bit more explanation. Thank goodness we have Reese Larson. What is Zeus's master bolt? The master bolt is the weapon that Zeus, um. 
used in the war of the titans if you guys don't know that myth um I'll be i do not so that 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 can, myth, it, can it be a quick myth um okay i'll just do it so basic so basic moral zeus is like in a family whereas all of his sisters and siblings are brothers and sisters are being swallowed by his dad cronus cronus had killed his father to become king of the titans they both all the family escape Cronus, in fact has to vomit them what? out what Cronus, in fact has to vomit them out so they can escape and there's like a big skedaddle thing with the war and stuff, but Zeus, Poseidon, Hades get get their weapon, choose a choice. Poseidon, the mighty trident. Zeus, um, Hades, particularly, just with a helmet. <laughs> and he just Zeus, wants a helmet? Yeah. He gets the worst gift. And, okay, I'm just going to be like, Hades? No. <laughs> Why? Thanks, Dad. <laughs> <laughs> Why? And then Zeus gets a lightning bolt. Um, not just, uh, people say in the myth that it's lightning bolts, but okay. it's just lightning bolt <laughs> okay so if he lost it he'd be like where is my thing he just could have lost it and, he's and, like, he got, and they got this after defeating chronos yeah okay. and then he, but i think that but why is the why is this lightning bolt such a big deal because is it like his favorite weapon um no it's not a favorite weapon it's the most powerful weapon it All has right. more destructive power than 80 nuclears Okay, now I fully understand the extent of this. I'm still a little lost in the it's Cronus thing. It's the weapon thing, that we'll sliced Cronus to, that. to bits. Yes, okay. So we have to not only return this bolt, 12-year-old little kid but who just if, figured out his dad is, but you have to do this. Misplaced it. Yeah, what if he just misplaced it? it Come it's on. It's only one thing. Okay, but he has to do it within one week. They have to do it before the summer solstice. How can you do that? Or else there's going to be massive war. <laughs> By the way, you have to leave immediately. Bring a couple friends. Oh, and by the way, you have to go visit Hades. <laughs> the worst family relation ever. You have Seriously. to visit your very you have to visit your uncle in a place full of dead people. And Percy does what I am so proud of him. He says to Mr. Brunner and to Mr. D, he says, No. Poseidon ignored me. My entire He's life. the worst. Yeah. Um, I'm not his son. I'm yeah. Sally Jackson's son. And, and then, then Mr. D, D says Who's Sally Jackson? And Percy is just enraged. Yes, and he says, Sally Jackson was my mom. She stood she's by the me. She one, cared for me. Uh, can I do that quote? Sure. She's the one who who's cared enough me to who cared enough me to call her my to call herself my mother. She's the one that took care of me all this time. And And then Grover comes in and he tells Sally the Jackson truth. is alive. And he says he says she's alive and here's the cool thing, she's in the underworld and that's where they want you to go anyway. So let's do this and uh and Percy says Percy says, When do we leave? Yeah. He's he's ready for it. So on that note, it is time for listener our feedback. listener feedback. Remember, friends, you can head on over to maryandblake.com. Click in the top right corner where it says contact us and leave your voicemail. You can also email us at maryandblakemedia at gmail.com. First step, we've got in studio Felicity. Hi, my name is Felicity. And what I liked best about this episode because was because Percy team wins capture the flag and i was super happy about that and my bad is that annabeth pushed percy because i wouldn't like to be pushed in cold water me neither and my great is that percy breaks clarice's spear so um clarice won't be able to stab him he can stab her that's that's a good call. <laughs> that way she can't be playing around with that anymore. Thank you so much, Felicity. And here is our next caller. Hi, Mary and Reese. This is Kevin from Canada, and I'm excited to start listening to another one of your podcasts. Yes. First, I wanted to comment about something you guys talked about on your first episode. Reese mentioned that it can seem kind of silly to see a statue with their clothes on especially for people his age. But what I think the episode did really well was showing Percy looking at the art and not laughing. I think it set a good example for younger viewers. Percy knew that the statues were gods, and so he was amazed by them even without their clothes. I think this showed that even if something seems silly on the surface, that it can have a deeper meaning too. Now my GBG for episode two. My good was when Percy thought that he didn't have anywhere to go, but then Hermes ended up being home for the unclaimed. This actually reminded me of the Harry Potter series when Helga Hufflepuff says, I'll take the lot and teach them all the same. My bad was um, when Percy kind of felt sad about his mom at the beginning and Grover didn't know what to say or how to help. 
Uh, it reminded me of sometimes in my own life when my friends are sad and I can't find the right words to, to help them feel better. And then my great was actually two Luke moments. So the first was when Percy thought he was about to get picked on by Luke, but instead he extended his hand and introduced himself and ended up being a good friend. And my second was when Luke said, when it's time, he's going to be ready. And then it cut to Percy doing a fun bunch of silly things like flossing and taking a pee. That really made me laugh. <laughs> Thanks again for the podcast, and I'm so excited to join this quest with you. Oh, Kevin, good to see you again on this podcast. <laughs> again, it's just good to hear your voice. All the way from Canada, it's That's just so right. good to see you. Yeah, Kevin is another listener of our Harry Potter podcast called The Potterverse. And that- he mentioned uh, with me on that, uh, ac- actually, on that episode, I was with you on the Harry Potter podcast. Yeah, so... Uh, what did you think about Kevin saying that the Hermes cabin reminds him a lot about Helga Hufflepuff? That is a good relation. Mm-hmm. I just, I just think, I think if Hermes ever had a wife, that would have to be Helga. <laughs> Helga Hufflepuff and Hermes uh, would would be quite the pair. I agree with you, buddy. Oh my gosh! All right. Well, it is time uh, to let you know about one. Um, Oh, it's my mere mortal theory of the week, right, buddy? Yep, it's a okay. mere mortal theory. So my mere mortal theory of the week. Now, of course, I haven't read these books. I am learning as I go. Um, I'm talking about the voice when when Percy's having that vivid nightmare dream. I know how you feel. Oh yes, keep, say it again to me. I'm going to digest it. I know how you feel. You want what's been taken from you. You want justice. Okay, so with the characters who I have been exposed to so far, um, I'm going to agree that it'll be Hades who is saying this to him. Hades, now that Reese tells me all he gets is a stupid helmet, um, I, <laughs> I think that he would want something better. He also has to deal with the dead people, and that doesn't sound like a lot of fun. So if I had to put my mere mortal theory of the week on who that voice is right now, I'm going to say... I think that is the god of the underworld, Hades, and we're all we're going to find out who it is in the future. Well, we want to thank you all so much for hanging out with Reese and myself in this second episode of the Percy Jackson Prophecy. Woo-woo. This episode and all of the subsequent episodes are going to be in all of the podcast apps. So if you listen on Apple Podcasts, we are there. If you listen on Spotify, we're there. We're on YouTube. We're all over the place, my friends. So make sure that you take a listen. And if you know someone else who has enjoyed this series or they're watching the show along with you, feel free to share along with them because uh, podcasts actually actually get learned about when friends tell friends about them. That's the way that people learn about podcasts. If you've already shared this podcast with someone else, thank you so very much. And also don't forget, we want to hear your voice, just like we got to hear Kevin from Canada. How did it feel for you, buddy, to hear someone's voice? It to hear to see hear Kevin's voice familiar from Canada, I'm like, oh my God, here he is again. Went right with when when I was in this podcast. That's thank right. you, Kevin, so much. Thank you, Kevin, and thank you for other people who call in. So you can call in by going to Mary and Blake. Remember, Blake is my husband, Reese is my son. Woo-woo. Maryandblake.com and click the contact us button to leave a voicemail. The voicemail will be 90 seconds or less. Say your first name, where you're from, and of course then you could share other insight, just like what you got to hear on this podcast. Well, until next time, Half Bloods. I am Mary Larson. My name is Reese. And remember, hold fast and brave the storm. That's right. This music's a little creepy. I know. I wonder why your dad picked such creepy music. I to think end the it's from the area with the voice, huh? <laughs> I know what you're feeling. Okay. All let's right. just close out. Let's guys. close. Bye-bye. Bye bye. Hold fast and brave the storm. <laughs>